Hey everybody, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of Founder Exchange. And today's guest is my friend Celine Cruz, who uh, is most recently the founder of Knock Knock TV, which uh, she'll be very excited to tell you about. And uh, I also know her because we acquired her company last year, uh, Restore, which was a home for direct-to-consumer brands based right here in San Francisco. Uh, so uh, let's jump right in. Welcome, Celine. Hi, guys. How are you? I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm actually here in the Mission Bay location for the first time ever at Beta, and I'm so excited to be here. What do you think about that that spot? It is gorgeous. I was just saying it reminds me of the Apple Store in New York. Um, it has yeah. this like futuristic vibe to it. Um, very open, bright, and the displays are like it's it's just large. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so where did you grow up and how did you grow up? Yeah, so I'm originally from Argentina, Buenos Aires. Um, and I moved to United States with my parents. Obviously, didn't come alone. Um, but I came here with my parents when I was about uh, three years old. And I grew up in Miami, Florida. And uh, yeah, I grew up in Miami. And then when I went to college, I went to Philadelphia. That's very humble. You went, you went to one of the best schools in the country, uh, <laughs> UPenn, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and your parents were entrepreneurs. You, you, you mentioned somewhere online that they were antique refinishers. What does that mean? Yeah, so my parents, uh, you know, immigrants from Argentina. My dad, he came to the United States with the dream of being a musician. Um, so he actually wanted to move to California. He never quite made it here on his own, so I came here for him. Um, but he wanted to be a musician. But in that process of trying to make it, he had a side job of essentially like refinishing uh, furniture and antiques. Back in the 90s, it was like a huge, you know, mo movement around um, antiques collection and, and refinishing. And he started, um, you know, his career doing that as a side project and then eventually became his full time um, profession. And, and both my parents were always really entrepreneurial. Like that was like their main job, but always like, you know, right. finding opportunities in other in other venues as well. Yeah. Did you work in their business? I did. I, I used to, you know, because they started really small, like my brother and I used to help after school and like weekends. My job was always like putting tape on the edges. Um, so when he would okay. like refinish things, like it wouldn't get splashed everywhere. Actually, growing up in Miami, my parents worked for our, for like celebrities. So I, you know, growing up, been to Oprah's house, J-Lo. Wow. Um, you know, my dad saw Britney Spears, you know, when she was kind of having, um, you know, like the big crisis situation. Uh, he actually met her at one of her clients' house. So they have really cool stories about that. That's awesome. Um, and I had read also that uh, that you had developed some kind of side business with some of the remnant fabric from their refinishing business. Yeah, exactly. So my, my parents did everything. Like they, you know, my, my grandfather actually from my dad's side, he used to be in the antique collection space in Argentina. Um, and antique businesses in Argentina, they're not like fancy, like they're in the United States. It's kind of like a humble, you know, like location and in, in the neighborhood and, and just like a lot of passion for history and antiques. So when my dad learned that craft, you know, he, he would have, you know, like, a, like, a, like in his workspace, have a lot of fabrics and a lot of like old stuff that he would repurpose. So when I was younger and I was like thinking about, you know, I, I've always been into thrift and like kind of creating my own like attire, I guess, if, if I can, mm -hmm. if, I, if I would call it that, like my own clothes. Um, I started picking a lot of that fabric to make handbags and clothing. And then eventually when I went to school and people were like, I like what you're wearing, where did you get it? I started just charging people, you know, like 20, 30 bucks. And like for me at that time, that nice. was like real money. Um, yeah, sure. I started making people, uh, you know, handbags and, and dresses out of the old antique furniture um, fabrics. And then in school, um, so you started a company called Archer Brighton. Where did that name come from? What did you guys do? <laughs> So Archer Brighton was when I was um, in college. So I had started businesses when I was a little bit younger and I've always been into retail and like, uh, you know, my little sewing machine, always making things by hand. And then Archer Brighton was a handbag business. And during the time of, of when I was graduating college, student loans were coming up and I was trying to decide. I studied political communication. So like my, you know, like the jobs that were available to me were not well paying at all. Um, so when I was thinking about what am I going to do after college, you know, I kind of started thinking uh, with a friend of mine, actually, you know, how do we, you know, at the time, like make some money to pay off these loans? 
Um, so that's kind of how I got started and, you know, my friend as well joined me and then later left. Um, but yeah, we essentially, the, the, the idea behind it was just to pay student loans and it, and it took off longer, like much bigger than expected. Amazing. And you also spent some time working in, uh, in public service and, and I, I think I read you worked, uh, in Congress as an aide of some sort. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, like, as I mentioned, I study political communications. Um, coming from an immigration background, my parents struggled with legalization for much of their life. Um, so when I was going to school, I really wanted to have a say in that. I wanted to be part of that process. Um, I started volunteering in political campaigns with John Kerry and then went on to work for the Obama campaign. So then when I was in college, I you know, wanted to really work in the Senate. So I was very fortunate because unfortunately, a lot of times when you get an internship in the Senate, it's a lot of like networking and a lot of like people's kids that go and, and get those internships. Sure. Um, so, so luckily for me, I, I had to hustle for sure, but um, <laughs> was able to get a, a position there under the um, legislative uh, branch. So I was able to actually write a legislation, um, well, a resolution for the senator of Pennsylvania that made it yes. into the immigration reform, passed wow. the Senate, but unfortunately did not pass the House. Oh, okay. That's that's really yeah. fun. So really I could have been part of like immigration reform, but <laughs> you know, here um, we are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's. I'm gonna return back to the immigration thing a little bit later. But uh, so at some point, you uh, you had an itch to do something with more scale. I think you had you mentioned that uh, you were struggling to break out of pure hustle mode. Um, yeah. So what, what did you do? When did you come out to California and what was your idea? Yeah, for sure. So my, my big thing, once I saw like back when I started Archer Bright and like starting a direct to consumer brand was a little bit easier. Uh, you can open an Instagram account you can start advertising. Uh, people would see your post. Um, obviously social media advertisement has gotten a lot more complicated, very crowded now. Um, so when I, when I first started my business, the first few years, it was kind of easy peasy, like start a, a, a community around your brand online. So pretty simple. Um, I would say by year three, four and fourth year, I started to really see that it was quite complicated to grow the business by just being online. And from a personal level as well, I started to feel a little bit alone because I had actually never properly had work experience. Like I had always done, the, done these like hustles and projects and businesses. Um, so I was kind of like insecure about it. I was like, well, you know, like I should probably get more, like, e even though it's right. funny, cause now I look at it, I'm like, that was a great business. I had to, I could work whenever I wanted to, I could not work whenever I wanted to. But at the time I was so self-conscious about it. So when I moved to California, it was really about the search around, you know, I wanted to find other people that are in the tech space and that understood what I was doing. I didn't want to feel like a loser. I know it sounds bad, but it's like, you know, if you're not in the right setup and sure, people will you think what you're you were good doing. enough. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like I remember when I had my lunch breaks, people would always tell me like, can you just not get a job? Like that was always like part of the conversation. Like not, it wasn't like in people's eyes outside of California, like it wasn't a choice for me to be an entrepreneur at the time. It right. was like kind of like the only thing I could get, you know? So I really what wanted to be in a What was the source was of that feeling for you? I mean, uh, of feeling like, cause you, you know, on paper, like you went yeah. to one of the best schools in the country. You had been starting businesses, like hustling to make money. Like why did you yeah. still feel so? anxious about it? Yeah, I mean, I it definitely two parts, like the environment, um, even though I went to Penn, like the Penn graduate tends to go to New York and walk and work in Wall Street or like work in, you know, like a fancy like fashion, you know, like um, company like Vogue and, and th those are like where you are, if you're successful, that's where you land. Um, so at the time, I mean, a lot has changed in the last few years. Like, at the time when I was graduating, nobody was trying to be an entrepreneur. Like it was, you know, not not the path that people went through, especially if you went to a good school. Um, so I think that that was like seeing my friends, you know, make money a lot. Because when you're starting a company, you're not making money right off the bat. <laughs> you're definitely no. not. Um, so seeing them have like a really good salary, seeing them get promoted, um, seeing them take breaks, like take vacations, like the first few years actually even i'm going to be honest even now like i rarely take a vacation i'm very work mode oriented um and, it, and it's really a sacrifice that you're doing when you're starting a business like it is your child it's your baby um so i think that's one part like kind of like my you know the people that i was friends with and and that and the space that i was living in in the northeast at the time right. um it's very like traditional oriented california is the gold you know kind of like the golden era like it's everything's like everyone here is trying to hustle and create something 
And then the other part is definitely me. Like it's, you know, like I said, I didn't have work experience. So like that was something that, you know, coming from an immigrant background, you know, your parents teach you like, you know, we're going to work hard to even go to school and you can get a good degree and then you can make money. And that's like the pathway. So right. for me to say to my parents, like, hey, I'm going to do entrepreneurship like you did. Like they don't view entrepreneurship as something glamorous. They view it as like, you know, like it's like the only <laughs> you option. You failed to get them. a job at Google. Yeah, exactly. So for yeah. them, it was so, so I think it's both sides just kind of like adding this pressure of like, you know, sometimes I don't feel about it so much right now. But like before I was like, why couldn't I just take a job at Google for a few years uh -huh. and then like done something I wanted to. Um, so I think it's just like that internalness. Yeah. Um, so you you came out, um, you know, I think you settled on Restore and maybe you can tell us a little bit about that idea. And I know that uh, you went out to raise money uh, first and it didn't really work. And then you found, uh, you did found it, find a community that, that really helped, right? Yeah, for sure. So when I first moved to San Francisco and I was working on my first company, Archer Bryden, um, I started to see that everyone, again, like had their like amazing jobs with like free lunch. And, and I was working out of my apartment alone and, you know, kind of like learning things by myself. So I it was really inspired by San Francisco and, you know, places that were doing co-working and, and that community of entrepreneurship. So even though my company didn't quite fit the like traditional startup in San Francisco, like I knew there was people like me that were starting like direct to consumer brands and perhaps needed a space of our own. Um, so I actually in my I got really lucky. My first apartment when I moved to San Francisco, it was an old yoga studio that was converted illegally. Uh, to a residential apartment. So it was like this big, I think it was almost like a thousand square feet, I think maybe 800 square feet of uh, open space, you know? So like I made it, uh, I went to Ikea and I bought a bunch of cool stuff and I made it into a co-working meets like, like living space. Um, so I would live on the second portion of it and the front of it was like my co-working area. And, and, and when I made this space where I can showcase my products and work out of there and then made the front of it kind of like open to the customer, um, I started to see that there was other people that were doing direct to consumer brands that wanted to work out of there with me and I wanted to work with them and they wanted to showcase their products out of my space as well. And then it gradually became this idea of Restore. So Restore, what ended up becoming was a place of discovering direct to consumer brands. So primarily in the lifestyle, like beauty space, um, and also like having a portion around co-working. So I wanted to really create a space that wasn't just about passively shopping. Um, like it's like when you and similar to beta when you come to the space of restore it wasn't about like i know what i want it was about discovery reading the stories of the founders like i really wanted to put a spotlight on the founders maybe because i felt self-conscious about being a founder so i wanted to, every founder to feel like a rock star at restore sure. like here's where you are a celebrity you know we're gonna tell your story and make you bigger than life and then give them a, a third place um like the third floor which was for them to work on these ideas and collaborate together because a lot of a lot of uh lifestyle and direct to consumer brands you know you could go at it alone or you could work together and i think that's where beta and restore really were aligned this idea that like together we're stronger and the customers here to discover all these different stories um instead of like putting all this like pressure into like if you want to be successful open your own store and like have your own experience yeah no, I remember coming to Restore right after you opened. I don't remember getting an invite to the uh, launch party, unfortunately. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I went and I uh, went with my wife as well. And and the thing about great retail experiences is you you just um, you're not uh, for me at least. You know, being in the industry, I'm very conscious of every detail of the space, and you know, yeah. noticing like I notice. Uh, you know, when there's like structural problems with the space, these weird <laughs> things like that. I'm very um, yeah. aware, but but I forget I for, when I walk into a great, you know, a, a place that I'm having a great experience, I really forget about that and just yeah. get involved in looking at everything that's there and thinking about, you know, the people that made those products. And and I think I'm um, wearing a pair of socks that I bought there uh, yeah. the first time, like the ones that had um, these, uh, they're like mismatched, but they all kind of have a, a different theme. Um, yeah. I those socks, but, uh, I'm forgetting the name, but I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, everything there was just so well curated. Um, the staff were really, really lovely. Um, and I probably texted my team that day and told them all, because everyone eventually came and <laughs> paid their respects to, to Restore. Um, Yay. And I really loved that you guys had like a event board 
uh, or some kind of, I can't remember what, what it was exactly, but yeah. um, that, that made, that gave that space like this feeling of that this wasn't just a store. It was just, it was a community and there was always yeah. going to be something happening there. Um, yeah, exactly. And, I, and I, oh, go ahead. No, no, please. I was going to say exactly like one of the main ideas behind that. And, and again, I, beta has been um, really good at it as well um, is, is around like I had to learn a lot of hard lessons by myself as a founder. And I wanted the next batch of direct to consumer brands to feel like you don't have to learn this alone. So a lot of the events that we, you know, produced around Restore were around educating people how to start brands and educating them about partnerships. So even having we used to have like matching days. Of like let's match an influencer with a brand and and that sort of thing it's like how can we as a space and a community right, help yeah. these people succeed so um so last year uh you know retail was hit by a tsunami uh and you know like us back in uh in march uh we had to shut our stores uh, especially in the city yeah. and you know really felt like it, there wasn't really clear back then and still isn't, to be honest, but wasn't really clear back then when we'd be allowed to reopen, what, you know, what the recovery is going to look like, traffic is going to look like. Um, mm -hmm. And so we started talking a bit and and we shared a vision for how to get through this. Um, but you had a couple of interesting ways to deal with this. And I wanted to ask you two questions. One is, um, you know, you've mentioned in the past here as, as well in some written materials, how important community was to you. and and how did you find that or deal with that um, through the last year? And then secondly, you know, what projects or things, because you're always thinking about the next thing, what did you develop and, and build during, uh, during COVID and during last year that um, kind of led to you to where you are today? For sure. I mean, when COVID hit, it was, it was kind of starting from scratch. Like for us, we had plans like to open in LA, like we were making these moves about doing another round and when it hit, we were like, well, there's two routes we can take. Well, to be honest, like that, at that moment, we were like, what the hell is going on? You know, and that's why I reached out originally was to be like, okay, we're all in this situation together. Um, what can we do to survive it? And like, what can we do to continue? Because at the time, like we weren't even sure how long this was going to last, what was going on. Like San Francisco was one of the first shutdown uh, cities. Um, and even till today has, has had one of the strictest um, you know, kind of like, like shutdown orders, essentially. Um, so I think to me, like when it first happened, I, I had never experienced something like that. And I knew nobody else had experienced anything like that. So I think it put in my perspective, everyone's guard down. And it was kind of like, let's come together. And how do we, as a retail community, as retail leaders, like, how do we answer to what's going on? Because it wasn't just about closing the store. It was about you know, what do we do with the contracts that we have with these brands that we're carrying? What do, what do the brands do with the inventory they had just sent us? Super excited, you know, uh, to, to sell these items. And what do we do with the staff as well? Like, how do we deal with all these, you know, issues? And, and of course, like, you know, it, it was complicated. So I think that's one of the main reasons I reached out in the beginning. It was like a need to like be part of like the community and understand like what you guys were doing from our, your end and what should we be doing as well? And of course that ended up, you know, kind of like leading to something even better than expected. Um, but, but I would say like, that's the first thing for me as a founder, it's always been, you know, don't be afraid to like reach out to people. Um, I think a lot of times like people are like very competitive and they're kind of like, they stay in their lane. And I think it's really wise to, you know, just like get to know people. You never know, like, you know, like, even though we didn't meet at the conference technically, like it was good that I had reached out to you because it like, had kind of like established, um, you know, like, yeah. already, like a line of conversation, communication, you know? So I think that's the one thing I would say, like, you know, for me, it was important, like connecting with the community and, and kind of coming up with a solution almost together. Um, and then, and then on the other end with the customer building a community around there, I, you know, we didn't have an e-commerce when COVID hit. So we were kind of like trying to move really quickly and build something out, but we had tons of inventory, we had tons of brands. So it wasn't going to be a very quick solution, unfortunately for us. Like it was going to take a few months for us to develop a website. So we actually ended up doing video streaming. So similar to what you guys are doing uh, right now with beta, we start to do that for restore in a very like not strategic way whatsoever, but in a very like we have customers, we have to sell something. Let's get on camera and do something. 
Um, so we were doing it through Instagram, Instagram Live. We did some Zooms and, you know, we started to realize we're like, wow, like we, obviously it took time to get to this point. It wasn't like the first time, but like eventually when we got a little bit better about it, we could do like the sales of four hours in an hour, um, right. you know, without the operational cost. So I saw the opportunity for two reasons. One, obviously it was an opportunity to monetize and help our brands like showcase their products in the way that Restore would showcase their products in a, in a human storytelling way, not just a product image. And then two, um, it was a way for us to, to, to be innovative and to do something that was scalable for the physical store. Like I am, I don't necessarily believe a, a catalog and a, and a retail is the way that is omni-channel. Like I think live streaming is probably a closer connection to true omni-channel for physical mm -hmm. retail. Yeah. I love that. So, um, so you, so tell me, and, and I think the name, the name of your, I mean, is this a, is it a company? I mean, tell, tell me more about knock knock and. Yeah. So when we did, uh, start doing this experiment of live streaming for restore, we eventually started to see that, like, I'm a big shop, small shopper here in San Francisco. And when I started to see those stores that were shut down, and then I would walk by their store when they reopened and it was empty, you know, and I was like, how are these people going to survive? Because, you know, you guys and we were VC backed, you know, so we had not only, you know, some money, but like also resources, like we, we were learning a lot. Mm -hmm. But a small business hit by COVID, they were just, you know, like sitting ducks, just like waiting to see what was going to happen. So when I saw the, you know, the magic for me in live streaming for Restore, I started to teach people because because they didn't have a website. A lot of these physical stores still don't have a website. Um, and if they do have a website, it's like out of date. Like it's not, you know, like their full catalog isn't part of it, but they do have a customer base. Like they have a list of customers that love their store. Um, so I started to kind of like work, you know, Kosh and I, um, you know, Kosh, but we started to work with small retailers and teaching them how to live stream. And in the beginning, it was just like, here, turn on Zoom, go to like, you know, go on your phone. And then we start to realize that there was an opportunity around creating an online community with these stores live streaming from their shop. So think about like a virtual neighborhood where like if you can virtually travel to different places and see like all the shops in, in like popular blocks. And especially now with COVID, um, you know, the desire to travel is really high. So like what if through live streaming, you could essentially be in New York City 24 seven with these cool shops and and anything from like, you know, like a food, like a restaurant to a, a retailer could be on the platform. And, and I'm a big believer in collaboration at all points. Oh, like the restaurant I, work, they would stream the, the kitchen. Or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the cool thing. Is, yeah. So we provide the technology. We don't actually help them, uh, you know, kind of like do the videos or anything like that. So some people have done really creative stuff where they like just put a camera and it's almost like a security camera. Like they just live stream 24 <laughs> seven. And you can kind of see like people, uh, you know, like pack up orders and like just do behind the scenes. And there's other people that do shows around it and they're more like, right. I'm going to show up at this hour and do this, you know, this like segment around, you know, like new arrivals. And it's been really interesting. We, we launched it in Cyber Monday and it was we launched it insanely quick just to get something out. We wanted to help these retailers in particular uh, for the holiday season because we didn't want them to like not have an option. Um, cause this is, this is San Francisco. So we were shut down for the holiday pretty much. Like even physical right. retailers were limited. Um, so we wanted to get that out for them and we had a very successful, um, cyber Monday and holiday season. We were able to like, you know, make real money. Um, I joke around with caution call. Like it was like almost like a local go, go fund me, like a live streaming go fund me. Cause we were able to make, uh, these retailers real money. We launched with about 25 partners. Um, and since then now we're kind of like learning everything that we've gathered, all the learnings, we're actually, um, launching an app for the experience as well. Um, so, so that's kind of where we're at. We're just gathering all the learnings and, um, bringing in more partners to be part of this. I love that. Yeah. I mean, we've, we, uh, we started, I mean, similarly, you know, right after March, we started experimenting with different types of video. It felt like, uh, the nearest thing to, um, to a store experience uh, that we could get without being able to uh, be in a store. And um, and over time, it's kind of catapulted into us getting more serious about it, thinking about production quality, um, formatting sets, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I've been you know, thinking, I mean, video, video commerce hasn't really uh, taken off in the US the way it has in other places. Yeah. Like there's a $100 billion company in China called Pinduoduo that's pretty much a, kind of what you described. It's people 
um, with a camera selling things and is extremely popular. I mean, yeah. What do you think? Um, do, you, do you think that we're that the U.S. Is, and this market is ready for this yet? And um, and yeah, tell me about uh, what, what you yeah. see kind of overall. That's a good question. I mean, I, I definitely I definitely think the market is growing, even if you look at like China alone, like where they started, like even last year, where they are today. And even the U.S., like I think we're like, what is it like a billion? We're at a billion today, like in the U.S. market. Like, you know, I, I predict it's going to get bigger. Like I, I just why wouldn't it? It's like barely existing right now. Um, so I definitely believe in live streaming because I've experienced the magic of it myself, both as a user and a, and a viewer. Um, like I, you know, I was sharing earlier, like I, I'm working from home now and I hate just being like in, in a silent place. Like I miss the office. I miss the sounds like I like chaos. Like I, I like chaos. Um, so being in my room and all quiet, like that doesn't work for me. So a lot of times I'll put audio like clubhouse or I'll put a, a live streaming. I've actually downloaded some live streaming apps from China and I'll put in the background. I've used TikTok as, um, as audio in the background. So I think even for that, you know, usage alone, which is like such a minimum, you know, like like small usage, like I love sure. live streaming because it lets you like be outside of your your physical space. Like it lets you like transport into yeah. different places and connect with humans. And and like, honestly, like I think that, you know, the world needs more fun. You know, I think a lot of times like everyone's really like um, system oriented, like, oh, we need to have all the information for someone to buy something. It's like, Maybe you just have to make it fun for someone to buy something and let them escape for a few. And, you know, maybe maybe that's what we need too. like there, there's magic in that, too. So I think live streaming brings a little bit of humanity to the Internet and it brings fun into buying. Same thing as a physical store. Um, so I think it's going to be a bright future. And I also think there's a lot of opportunity, like every sector uh, could do their own. Like like live streaming to me is like a feature. It's like you still have to do something with that feature. And, and, and yes, nobody has proved it yet. And there's a lot of homework to be done. Um, but there's big opportunities for us being kind of like innovators in that space. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm, I'm very excited to see what you guys are, are up to. Um, last question, uh, back to the idea of, of trying to break out of pure hustle mode. Um, have, are, are, have you broken out of that or is it just a way of life at this point for you? So that's, that's like the conversation I have every weekend. Um, yeah. You know, it's hard. I definitely think COVID has helped bring back a little bit of uh, work-life balance. Um, I, I guess because I'm not going to like after work events and I'm trying to like, I, I work and then I, I've been, I got a Peloton, you know, I actually don't have the bike, but I got the, the app because the bike takes too long to get here. Um, and I've been doing that before I didn't work out ever. Um, so, so I think that definitely now there's been more of a work-life balance just because you're working from home. You're not traveling anywhere. There's nothing else to do but work in life. Um, but you know, I think it's, it's a choice. Like I do believe maybe it's unfortunate, but I do believe to, to build greatness, there's a lot of sacrifice there. And, and I, I want to build greatness and I've dedicated, you know, a few years of my life and I, and I want to dedicate a few more to, to the pursuit of greatness in my career, in the things that I'm building. Like I'm very passionate about what I do. So I, I would definitely said if, if you don't like your work, I would say definitely have more of a work-life balance, but if you really like what you do and you're and you're in a mission to to pursue that vision for yourself, like, you know, I, I think it's okay to be a little addicted to work. <laughs> and with that, we'll wrap it up. I love that. With greatness takes sacrifice. I completely agree. Um, thank you so much to Celine Cruz, founder of Knock Knock TV and Restore, uh, for joining us today on Founder Exchange.